Heavenly Father, we want to say first and foremost, Lord, that we love you today. We thank you for uh, who you are, what you've done in each of our lives, and what your word promises is yet to come. Lord, as we begin this hour of worship, we just ask that you would clear our hearts and minds and that, uh, Lord, that you would remove any barriers or obstacles that would keep us from worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And, Lord, that we could leave this place uplifted and refreshed and renewed. And, Lord, most of all, if there's someone in our midst today who doesn't know you in the free pardon of sin, that today might be the day that your Holy Spirit draws them. Uh, Lord, I pray that you could use our, our music. I pray you'd use our preacher. But more, than, more than anything, Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified. Use your Holy Spirit to draw them into a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we love you and praise you. And we ask all this in your precious holy name. Amen. And amen. Stand with us, we continue to sing. You said, boy, I've always wanted to sing in that choir. Here's your chance to let you audition with this song. To God be the glory. You sing it from the depths of your heart this morning. Here we go. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So love me.
a moment right now and recognize any special guests that we have. So what we want to do, if this is your first time visiting with us, we want you to know, first of all, you're an honored guest, and uh, we want to recognize you. These gentlemen down front have a gift packet they'd love to give you. So if you are visiting with us today for the very first time, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up real quick, and they will give you this packet right back here on the back row, Garrett. Amen. Amen. Thank you for visiting with us. And is that it? Did I miss anybody else? Nobody over here? All right. Well, as we love to do around here, and if, by the way, if you haven't noticed yet, Brother Mickey's not here. He and Miss Sue Ann are somewhere on a boat in the ocean. I don't know what ocean and what boat, but they're down there having a good time, uh, taking some time away, uh, went on a cruise. So you pray for them for their safe return. We'll miss them while they're gone. But we're still going to have a lot of fun, and, uh, and we're still going to have church. Uh, God, uh, you know, God gave us the means to keep that moving forward, and we're going to do that. So uh, we like to sing choruses around here, and this one here is one of our favorites. And I like to apply this to everything in life that I can't do. He's able to do it, whether I can or not. So as we sing this, you think about that. The next time that something comes across your path, and you think, man, how am I going to deal with this? Think about this song. He's able to deal with it. He's able to take care of it. He's able to conquer it. You sing it with us. Here we go. He's able. He's able. I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able. He's able. And I know. that song don't think I think he's able I know he's able okay that's what it says that's what the writer wrote and that's what he meant his word promises that God will never fail us and I know he's able here's this course is about what we're here to do today we're going to sing about we're going to talk about we're going to preach about Jesus he's the answer to all our problems every one of them no bit none are too big are too small that Jesus doesn't want to be involved in your solution. So you sing it with us this morning. Here we go. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of Kings to see, the Lord of sing it one more time y'all commit to talking about Jesus today we're gonna have we're gonna sing about him brother Don's gonna preach about him I know in your heart have you spoken to Jesus today you can anytime Chuck was talking in Sunday school he made mention of something that brought back a memory anybody ever talked on a party line anybody remember the party lines 
You used to, you had to pick it up real quietly and make sure nobody was on it before you could start taking 10 minutes to dial the phone. Wasn't no push button. You had to turn that rotary. I know I'm telling my age, aren't I? Do you know you don't have to get on a party line to talk to God? Direct connection. And you know what's even better than that? His phone's never busy. He'll answer every time. Let's sing it through one more time. Here we go. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings is He, the Lord of lords supreme through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the Lord. Well, let's talk about Jesus. seated. Ordinarily during this time we would uh, take a break and shake hands and hug and kiss and just slobber all over one another but with COVID we've kind of stopped that. So hopefully in a few months we can get back to doing that again uh, because our church is blessed with a room full of huggers and uh, that's fine okay. But uh, we want to sing a song for you this morning that talks about Uh, I think what our motives in life ought to be every day. Unfortunately, I'll be the first to admit I fail a lot at it. But uh, our goal in life every day ought to be to glorify and honor God in everything that we do. And uh, that's what this song talks about this morning. That uh, all that we do ought to be for His honor and His glory. I hope it will bless you today. servant of the one who died for me. My highest dream is finishing the course and living life every day for my Lord. All that I've done, every race run, every victory I play was not about me, never should be. Keep lifting his name.
Stand with us one last time, if you would. We'll let our choir go down. Our ushers are going to come in and take today's offering. 504 in your hymn book. If you're using a hymn book, we'll put the words on our screen. He touched me. What a song. What a story. And what a, what a lesson in this song. Think about the words as we sing them. And apply them to yourself. Most of you, when we get to that uh, part about where it says, You've been shackled by a heavy burden. How many has been shackled by a heavy burden? Let me see your hand. How many are being shackled by one right now? Yeah, a bunch of us. So God can, God can help carry that burden. In a lot of cases, he'll just take it all the way away from you. But he'll most definitely help you carry it. You sing it with us this morning. Here we go. Shackled by a heavy burden Meet the Lord the young crowd today except for these guys over here is there some strategy in this Bobby you having the younger crowd take this up oh okay that's good I don't worry all right we're gonna it's a time to take our offering and I just pray that you would uh, be faithful to God's command that we give a tithe and an offering and 
And uh, just pray that uh, the monies you give can be used to further the gospel. That lost souls might come to know him uh, through this tithing offering. That's why we do it. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you again for this day. I pray, Lord, as we pause to take this offering, that you would just uh, uh, bless this offering. I pray you bless the, the, those that give and those that would be faithful to follow your command. And we'll praise you and honor you for all of eternity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Becky and I are going to... Oh, there she is. <laughs> we're going to sing, sing an old uh, song for you this morning. We've, sang it, we've been singing this song for years and years. But it talks about uh, something. And I want to ask you a question about that. How many people have ever think you've witnessed a miracle? Raise your hand. Well, a lot of you. Good. All right, for those of you who didn't witness a miracle, if you know Christ as your Savior, did you realize that you are a miracle? Amen. Through the miracle of what Christ did on Calvary's cross, Amen. He stopped your, your uh, direction headed for hell and changed your direction. Now you're headed for heaven. That's a miracle. Because what you were headed for in hell is what you deserved. Yeah. And me. I deserved that. But God loved me enough, he loved you enough to die on Calvary's cross so that your destination and your eternity could be changed. So every one of us in this room who know Christ as Savior has a miracle in us. We are a miracle. And if you're sitting here this morning and you think, well, I don't remember that time I've ever gotten to that place where Christ was living in me. We're going to give you the opportunity to do that today before you leave this building. And I, I beg you to, to change your heart and to accept him as your Savior. You listen to this song. It says, there's a miracle in me. Oh, to be there when the Savior spoke the great command and to witness in the wonders of His wonder-working hands. No miracle has touched my eyes or caused my heart to see. But by faith I now can realize there's a miracle in me. I have never seen the thousands fed or the blind made to see. I have never watched him raise the dead, but I know when he lifted me, there's a wonder right before my eyes, close enough to see. In my heart is where this wonder lies, there's a me. If we have a faith that's measured by the smallest mustard seed, well, then our mountains, they can be mastered by the master of our needs. When we have a child like faith, he said, He'd do the greatest things To heal the sick And to raise the dead And be a miracle in me I have never seen The thousands fed Or the blind made to see I have never watched 
Him raised the dead, but I know He lifted me. There's a wonder right before my eyes, close enough to see. And in my heart is where this wonder lies. There's a miracle in me. There's a wonder right before my eyes close enough to see. In my heart is where this wonder lies. There's a miracle in Brother Don has been to our church many times over the years, and I always look forward to him coming. Uh, not that I don't enjoy my pastor, but it's good to get uh, it's good to, good to get a fresh drink of water from a different well every once in a while, and uh, that's what I uh, know that we're going to get this morning from Brother Don. So, Brother Don, you come and bring the word to us, and uh, it is all yours. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that was. Great singing, great music. Uh, very few churches have this type of music program. Amen. And I commend this choir director and all those in the choir. It's just, just a wonderful, a wonderful blessing. And I'm happy to be here again today. And I want to say to the guests, you certainly need to be here when Brother Oliver preaches. The pastor, you need to come back and hear him if you haven't already done that. He is a blessing, he's a man of God, and you'll, you'll be blessed by hearing the pastor of this church. And if I lived in this area and didn't have a good church, I do live in this area, but I, I've got a good church, I, I have to almost say this, I have to stay there, I pastored it for 45 years, and if I leave now, I'm in a mess. <laughs> but, if, but if I didn't have a good church, I promise you, this would be my first consideration. I mean that. I, I love this church, I love your preacher and his precious wife, and I'm glad it's them on the boat and, and having a vacation. I'm glad of that. I've made three trips on, on, the, on the sea, and my wife and I, and uh, I need to tell this, it's, it's humorous. Uh, Brother Ray Christian was related to Bill Dixon, Bill and Emma Dixon. They were, his wife was related to Emma, and uh, um, we went on a tour on a boat, and uh, Emma and, and Bill went with us and some others from the church. And uh, we, we docked at this place, and uh, uh, they, had, uh, they had a tour into town. And uh, the, the ladies didn't want to go. My wife's here this morning. She remembers this. Uh, the ladies didn't want to go. And so Bill and I said, we'll go by ourselves. So we went down, and we got down and learned that the cab was about $25 for, uh, per, per person. But if you had four, you could get a special, special price. So Bill and I were standing there, and these two ladies walked up to us and said, uh, you guys going to town? And Brother Bill said, yes, ma'am, we are. And uh, she said, would y'all want to split the cab with us and ride together and save $5? And Bill said, well, I, yeah, we'll probably do that. So when Bill said that, I reached and got a hold of the right front door on that cab. I was going to ride in the front. I wasn't going to make no mistake about that. So I opened, opened the door and got in. Bill got in the back and the ladies got beside of Bill. And uh, we got about halfway to the town and one of these ladies said, uh, you guys married? <laughs> and I, Brother Ray, I won't ever forget this. Bill with a squeaky voice, Bill Dixon said, we're muchly married. <laughs> So that was, that was a trip I'll never forget. But I'm so glad to be here today. Let me share this with you. I heard the story about two wooded people. They went to church together. And uh, they'd been going out to eat together. And they just, uh, um, they just really uh, was fun to one another. And finally, the old gentleman 
uh, asked the lady uh, to marry him. And she said, I will. And uh, the only problem was the next morning when he woke up, he said, I asked that precious lady to marry me. But he said, for the life of me, I can't remember if she said yes or no. <laughs> and he, he battled with that and, and just uh, wondered about that. And finally he said, well, I'm just going to, only way I'm going to find out, I'm going to call her. And he called her on the phone and he said, I, first of all, may I apologize? He said, I'm so embarrassed to call you with this question. He said, I know I asked you to marry me yesterday, but for the life of me, I can't remember what you said. She said, you don't know how thankful I am for this phone call. She said, all morning, said, I knew that I'd told somebody I'd marry him, but I, don't, I didn't remember who it was. <laughs> so uh, my, my wife of many, many years, uh, I began preaching when I was 18, and my wife has been with me by my side ever since. Amen. She has dementia now, and her memory is not what it used to be. But I'm so happy you're here, Catherine. I love you. And I'm, I'm grateful for all of these years that God's given us. You've been a great wife to me. You will have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to speak today from the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 and 2 Thessalonians are two of my favorite books in the Bible. Because I believe that the church at Thessalonica was probably the most spiritual church of all the epistles that Paul wrote, wrote about. And uh, this, is, this is a blessing to me. And I want to share with you from 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, and we'll put in at uh, verse 13. Notice what he said. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, and that word ignorant is not used in a, bad word, in a bad way. It simply means I don't want you to not know this. I don't want you to forget this. But he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, what was he concerned about them perhaps being uh, untaught about or being confused about? Brethren, concerning those which are asleep, concerning those who had died. Now, I want to pause here a moment. And I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, let me just share quickly these verses. Chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor word, nor letter, as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. What had happened? Someone had either written a letter or started a uh, rumor, started a message, and said Paul preached this, or Paul sent this letter, and he, he was saying that those who had died, those who had not remained to the coming of the Lord, that he wasn't perhaps sure about where they were. He didn't understand in this, in this letter, somebody tried to confuse the people about their loved ones who had died in the Lord. And if we didn't have the Bible, the devil could tell us anything. But isn't it wonderful we have the, the clear word of God that we can go to? And Paul said, I don't want you to be, be unlearned about this. I don't want you to be, con be ignorant about this, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, who are these that are asleep? Those who had died with faith in Jesus. My loved ones and your loved ones, my brothers and my sisters who have died, there was nine living members in my family. And we had a big family raised on a farm and had just a wonderful life. I'm the only one left out of nine in my family. And if I didn't know where they were, I, sometimes at night I, I lay and think about, I think about, first of all, my mother. What a godly mother I had. What a humble mother I had. And I think about her and how, how I'm looking forward to seeing her. I don't have any doubt about where she's at. She's with the Lord. She died. 
but she's with the Lord. My brothers and sisters that made professions of faith in Christ, and I believe that, that they were real. And, and if they're real, they're with the Lord. They're with him. They're not dead. They're living in heaven. Amen. And he said, I want you to understand. Don't, don't be unlearned concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Would not we be so miserable today if we didn't have hope? Paul said, if I had hope only in this life, I'd be of all men most miserable. A preacher was talking to a young, young teenager one day, and he said, son, what are you going to do in well, your life? What are you going to do in life? He said, well, I'm going to finish high school. And the preacher said, then what? And he said, I'm gonna, uh, then I'm going to go to college. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to college and get a good education. And the preacher said, then what? And he said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to get a job. And I'm going to go to work and hopefully get a good job and be able to, to, to take, have a family and, 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 and take care of them. And the preacher said, then what? And he said, well, I suppose if I do a good job and and, and, and work and stay on the job, he said, I'll get to retire from the job. And he said, then what? And he said, well, when I retire, I hope I'll be able to travel some and, and see things that I've always wanted to see. And the preacher said to him, then what? And he said, well, you know, I'll die like everybody else. And the preacher said, then what? Then what? What about after death? You say, preacher, don't talk about death. That's so morbid. Listen, I, I have almost every week a funeral. Sometimes I have two a week. I'm saying to you, then what? Amen. Then what? And Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, who had been misinformed by a letter that someone sent and signed Paul's name to it. He said, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Your loved ones that are asleep. I don't want you to be ignorant about that. And listen to what he says. I don't want you to sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Have no hope. I hope he won't mind me mentioning this. Brother Ray Christian. I had a little part in his precious wife's funeral a few months ago. And uh, uh, listen, what, what if Ray had no hope? There's a hope. There's an assurance that she's with Jesus and that he's going to see her again. He's going to be with her. Amen. And many of you sitting here today, you have that hope. Oh, if I had, if I had no hope. If this life was all there was to it, I've had a good life. I've lived a long life, 82 years. And, and I've, had, I've had these many, many years of joy of preaching the gospel of my Savior. But if I had hope only in this life, I'd be of all men most miserable. But isn't it wonderful that we have hope? We don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. Why? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's, that's the key to it all. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead? Amen. With every ounce of my being, with every fiber of my mind, with every ounce of energy in my heart, I believe that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago plus died on the cross outside the city of Jerusalem, died on a hill called the place of the skull. Jesus died and was buried. And on the third day, he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And Jesus Christ is alive today. What a wonderful, wonderful hope. What a wonderful, wonderful assurance. If we believe that Jesus died, can I ask you, do you believe he died? Do you believe he died for you? Someone said to me, I pulled up in the yard 
and I was out visiting, and this guy had a dog in a fence, and the man was outside the fence, and when I pulled up, that dog just started leaping against that chain link fence trying to get to me. And uh, I uh, said to the man, I'm Don Richards, and I'm, I'm just out going from door to door. This has been several years ago. You could do it then. I said, I've just, I'm just going from door to door asking people if, if they know the Lord, if they're in church and know Christ. And he said, I don't want to hear any of that. He said, you get in your car and you get out of my yard. I don't want to hear that. I wish I could have told you that I grabbed him with the arm, put a hammerlock on him, and made him trust Jesus, but I didn't. I turned, in fact, he, I started to say something else, and he said, I'll open the gate on and let that dog out. And I hushed. And I got to the car, and I got my hand on the door handle so I could get in my car. And I said, sir, I want to tell you something. I won't ever, I won't ever come in your yard again to invite you to church or to tell you about Jesus. But if you, don't, if you don't trust Jesus and realize that Jesus died on the cross for you to save you, I'm sorry to tell you, but your destination after death will be the lake of fire. Amen. And he said, I'm not interested. I got in the car and left. Did you go back, preacher? No, I didn't go back. He warned me not to go back. But I hope he got saved. I hope he got saved. But listen, do you believe that Jesus died? Do you believe that? Oh, I, I stood at the place where they said Jesus was buried, the garden tomb. I believe he was buried there. I believe it's the actual place. I stood there, and this guy from England was the tour guide. He, was, he worked there at the garden tomb. That was his place, station, and he, he gave a message about the resurrection. And I'm telling you, I stood there and I, I, I just, the, the Holy Spirit, chills got all, and that, that, that doesn't save you having chills and all of that. But I stood there and my, I thought my heart was going to burst. I was so full and my heart was so full and he stood there and he said, let me tell you why we believe that this is where our Lord was buried and resurrected from. He said, I believe that, listen, he said, I believe that because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a preacher from Alabama, Altala, Alabama, and he was on the trip. And I heard somebody hollering, and he had a hold of one of those trees out there, and he was shimming around that tree, shouting and praising God when that preacher said that, when that guide said that. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus died. He died. That's, that's only half of the story. Thank God he rose again. Do you believe that Jesus, I'm asking all of us this question, do we believe that Jesus died and rose again? Do you believe that? With all of your heart, Jesus died and rose again. Listen to this. Even so, if we believe that, listen to this. Even so, if you believe Jesus died and rose again, you must believe this. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Amen. Now, I don't, put any, I don't put any credibility in a dream. Not at all. I believe the Bible. I preach from the Bible. I don't preach about dreams. But I want to just tell you a dream that I had about two years ago. I've never had it since. But I had this dream, and it was, it was beautiful. It was so real. This dream was. I dreamed that I, suddenly I woke up and I was in the most beautiful foyer that, I've, that I have ever seen. I've, I've, I've been to the governor's mansion. I've been inside the, the capitol. But I've never seen the beauty like, like this was in this, this giant foyer. And there were stairs coming down, just hundreds of stairs. And here came people down those stairs. And in this dream, this is what they were saying. We're home. We're home. We're home. I did not see her, but I sensed the presence of my mother. I know she was standing beside of me in this dream, my little mother. I didn't see her face, didn't see her, but I, I knew she was there. And I thought, I'm home. I thought, I've died. I'm home. I'm in heaven. I'm here. That's it. And I turned 
and I said to, to, the, to, to someone, I said, where is Jesus? And they said, down this hall. And I looked down that hall, and all I could see was a beautiful, beautiful light at the end of it, and I woke up. Never had it again. I'm telling you, and, and I, don't, I don't preach and believe that dreams solve anything, but I thank the Lord just let me kind of have that just to, just to kind of bless me and refresh me. I couldn't go back to sleep that night. I'm telling you, I was, and I thought of it day after day after day for, for weeks, how wonderful and how real it was. Heaven is so real. And he said here, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now let me tell you what's going to happen to your loved ones who have died in faith. They're in heaven at this very moment with Jesus. They're in a spiritual body. But listen to this. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, that's us. If I live long enough and Jesus comes back in my lifetime, he's talking about those people. We could be alive when Jesus comes back, but it don't really matter. If we go by death, he'll send an angel for us or he himself will come and escort us. We don't have to worry about that. You say, preacher, I don't like to talk about this death and I don't like to talk about heaven. Hey, let me tell you something. You may stay on this earth. I've been here 82 years. Uh, I may stay another few years. I don't know. But what is that in comparison to eternity? Forever and ever and ever and ever with no end. And he said, if you, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, listen to this, for them that sleep, the Lord will bring with him. He's coming again. We'll not, we'll not, We'll, we'll not prevent them or they won't prevent us. If Jesus comes before I die, this is what will happen. The dead in Christ will be raised at those graves. My wife and I have a marker over on 78 Highway at Eternal Hills. We, we have a marker in the, in the Calvary section of that memorial cemetery. We have a little adopted granddaughter that died at five years old, buried beside the grave. And we're, we're going to be buried beside her. We've already made the arrangements. I told someone the other day, and <laughs> they said, man, don't tell me that. that. That shocked me. Did you know that my wife and I have already got our casket picked out? You say, preacher, are you expecting to die? No, I'm looking for Jesus to come. I'm hoping that Jesus comes. But he may not come in my lifetime. But if he doesn't, we already have our caskets picked out. We've already got our grave lot taken care of. We got our markers up. And I thought, well, about two years ago, I thought, well, we need to, I need to find out what it would cost to have the graves open. I went over there, and I went ahead and paid for it. You know what they charged me to, to go ahead and pay in advance to have two graves open? $3,350. $3,350 to take a tractor and a backhoe. I could buy a used tractor and a backhoe almost for that. <laughs> but they'll take a tractor and a backhoe and it'll take about 15 minutes to dig a hole that you've already paid thousands of dollars for, the, the plot, and they'll dig a hole, put you in it, and cover you up. That's all right. If Jesus doesn't come, we'll use that. You say, preacher, what if Jesus comes? Well, they can do whatever they want to with it, those that are left. But Christ, listen to this. Christ, he said, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, if Jesus comes in our lifetime, we're not going to proceed. We're not going to proceed them that's in the grave. Listen to this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They'll rise first just before Jesus gets to where we can see and, and be changed. The, the dead will rise out of the grave. What about that? Amen. The dead's going to get up out of the grave. And just as they get up and get even with the earth, 
will be changed if we're still here. This body will put on immortality. This body will be changed into a body like Jesus has. We'll be changed and we'll all, listen to this, we'll all be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Let me tell you what's ahead for us. First of all, there's the return of the Lord. Our world is in a mess, folks. I've never seen a time like we're living in today. And I'm not an alarmist. I'm not, I'm, I'm not crying the blues. I'm having the time of my life. I'm saved. I'm, the Lord's given me reasonable help. And I'm saved. And my wife, God's given me a, a beautiful wife. And we've been together 66 years. And uh, I, I'm happy. I love life. I love it. But listen, the best is yet to come. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the cry of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then he said, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Now remember this, the Lord's return is before us, is coming. We know that's going to take place. There's a night or a day or an hour that Jesus Christ is going to return in the air. And the dead's going to get up out of those cemeteries, those that have died in faith. They'll be raised. And if we're still here, we'll be changed. We'll be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And listen, there'll be a, there'll be a, a resurrection and then there'll be a, a rapture. There'll be a transformation of us and we will have a reunion listen together he said with our loved ones oh yes I, this, this past year not, not 2022 but 2021 this past year I started at the first of the year and I began to write down names of preachers that I have preached for or preached with that had died. And about, by about October, I had 11 names on that list. And I just stopped. I said, I, I'm not going to do this no more. I'm not going to put no more names down. I'm talking about preachers that I knew, preachers that I had preached in their church, or they'd preached in my church. And I thought, Lord, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to destroy this list. I'm going to throw it in the trash. Somebody might find it and put my name on it. Yeah, but I'm telling you, people are dying. We're dying. And listen, I love you, but you're going to die. And sometimes you don't have to be old to die. I had the funeral last week of a young man that was 55 years old. I baptized him when he was a little boy. He and his mom and dad and, and older brother joined our church, joined Carmen Church. He was a wonderful man. I had the joy of marrying him to a, a beautiful girl in our church. And they, they started their family. They have three children. They even have grandchildren. But 55 years old, and he died with cancer. That, you say, preacher, did that bother you? It bothered me. And I could not have stood over his, over his remains. I could not have stood over him. If I didn't have a hope and know that he was saved and that he's with the Lord and his wife's going to see him again and his children's going to see him again and his grandkids, if they're saved, going to see him again. I say to you, the best is yet to come. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. What a reunion. When we meet our loved ones, meet our brothers and sisters, some of you will meet your mate. You'll meet your friends that you've, you've gone to church with. Isn't that, isn't that a blessing? Isn't that wonderful to know that we have that blessed assurance, that blessed hope? Listen to what he said. He said, we'll, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I could spend... I could spend two months telling you 
where we're going to be and what's going to happen. I could talk about the wonderful, blessed millennium that we're going to spend with Christ. I could talk about the time when that new heaven and new earth comes down from God out of heaven. And this earth is dissolved. God will judge this earth and it'll be dissolved and purified. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we'll live in that new heaven and new earth forever and ever and ever and never, never, never have any sickness, never have any pain, never, never, have, never have any problems, never be a tear there, never be a heartache there, and we'll be with the Lord. What a reunion. Isn't that wonderful? We'll be with the Lord throughout the eons of eternity. What a blessing. What a blessing. Now listen to this. The last verse. He said, wherefore. When you find this word wherefore in the Bible, it means in view of what you've just read, in view of what's just been said, or it means because of this. He said, because of these promises, because of this blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, because of all of this, he said, comfort one another with these words. Isn't that a blessing? We can comfort, we can have comfort with these words. We can have comfort. The greatest thing that could ever happen to a mortal person is to know Jesus, Amen. to meet Jesus, right. meet the Lord. I uh, had the blessing of being the pastor of an old gentleman up in Canton, Georgia. He and his precious wife, Miss Lola, they had, they had no children. He had no living brothers, no living sisters. She had no brothers or sisters. And their nearest kin, their nearest kin was a nephew over in Trenton, Georgia, and he was the vice president of a bank. And he hadn't seen him in, in uh, I don't know, years, I guess. But Miss Lola died first. But before, the, before they passed away, he said to me, I wished I could see my cousins in Arkansas. He said, I was raised in Arkansas, and I left. My dad left when I was eight years old, but said, I had some, I had some cousins there. I sure would like to see them, and uh, if they're still living. And he kept talking about that. So I said to him, Brother, Brother Wilkie, would you like for Catherine and I to carry you and Miss Lola to Arkansas? Now listen to this. The father she'd ever been was Athens, Georgia, and she was, about, she was about 78 years old then. The father's trip she'd ever made was to Athens, Georgia. Brother Arthur had never been out of the state of Georgia. I said, Brother Arthur, would you like for us to drive you and Miss Lola out to Arkansas? And he said, would you? I said, yeah. He said, I'll buy you a new set of tires if you will. I said, I don't need no tires. They're fine. He said, well, I, what, I'll buy the gas if you'll go. I said, we'll go. We'll go. So we, we went to Arkansas. And I, I'm saying this in love. But from Canton, Georgia to uh, Arkansas, uh, Eureka Springs and, and, and beyond, I'm telling you, I think Miss Lola read every road sign that we passed. <laughs> she had a speech impediment. <laughs> and she was sitting in the back and and she'd say, uh, cub ahead. <laughs> Feed limit, 35. <laughs> I mean, she read every road sign. Well, they're there to read, you know. So she read every road sign. The first night we stayed in a motel. We got a room joining. They had a room and then uh, we had a room. We had a door joining the rooms. And uh, so I said, uh, Brother Arthur, uh, we don't have to be in a hurry to get up in the morning. I said, no, we got plenty of time. Y'all rest. And about 545 the next morning, somebody knocked on that middle door. And Catherine said, Brother Don, Brother Don. I said, what, Lord? She said, get up. Brother Arthur's at the door. He's up. And he, had a, he told me, he said, if I have a problem sleeping, the doctor gave me a little green pill. said, I'm, I'll take that little green pill and I'll sleep good. I said, Catherine, tell Brother Arthur to take another green pill and go back to bed. <laughs> but I got up and opened the door, 
And we, we got our shower and got ready and went in to see if they were ready. And we got in there <laughs> and listen to this. Their bed was already made up. Beautiful. I mean, the spread was on the bed. Everything with pillows just arranged perfectly. And I said, Miss Lola, you don't have to make up the bed in this motel. They'll, they'll change the sheets and, and the pillowcases. And they'll, they'll do, they do that every day. She said, why they want to do that? We're not dirty. <laughs> she couldn't understand that. But I took Brother Arthur. And uh, I remember Miss Lola died. I had her funeral. And I had come to Stone Mountain. And I got word that Brother Arthur was in Piedmont Hospital. And he was very, very sick. And I went out to see him. And he was lying on the bed. He had lost so much weight. His little body was so frail. His jaw bones were so just sticking through almost. And I saw him moving his lips. His lips was chapped and cracked. And he was moving his lips. And I, I leaned over. I leaned over his little body and put my ear down where I could hear. And this is what he said. These are the last words he ever said to me. He said, Amen, Brother Don. Jesus is good. Jesus is good. I'll see you, Brother Wilkie. He's there. I'll see him someday. Amen. I'll see him. I'll see him. Comfort one another with these words. Does it comfort you to think about the coming of the Lord? Yeah. Does it comfort you to know that you're going to see your loved ones who've died in faith? Oh, you'll see them. You'll see them. You'll see them. Does it comfort you to know that you'll see your friends that you were so close to? I've got friends, just a host of friends. I've got friends that's been like a brother to me. I'm looking forward to seeing them in eternity. Every person that has this hope in him can comfort themselves with these words. Comfort yourself with these words. The Bible tells us in, uh, in the book of uh, 2 Peter that we are to look and hasten. Now listen to this. What are we to do, preacher, as Christians? We are to look and hasten. The Bible says we're to hasten the coming of the Lord. John, the last words that John ever said were these. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. John saw all that would take place when Jesus comes again. And he recorded it for us. And some of the last words, he said, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Are you looking for Jesus to come? He's coming. He's coming. Now listen to this. Every man that has this hope in him, you know what it'll make us do? It'll make us live right. We don't have to have somebody to beat us over the head and, and tell us that we do wrong, we make mistakes. We do. And it's good to be reminded, good to be challenged. But let me tell you something. If I'm looking, if I'm looking for Jesus to come, it'll cause me to want to do right. Hey, if you're looking for Jesus to come, you don't have to worry about somebody else's wife on the job looking better to you than yours does. Amen? Amen. If you're looking for Jesus to come, you're not looking for some way to connive and steal and cheat your local, your friend, your neighbors. You're not looking for that. Every man that has this hope in him, listen, every man that has this hope in Jesus that he's coming again, we purify ourselves even as Jesus is pure. He's coming. He's coming. I remember years ago, Dr. Don R. Rice brought the sword of the Lord to Atlanta. And what they did, they had it in, the, in one of the big auditoriums in Atlanta. And they had different pastors from the, from the area to moderate the meetings of the morning and at night. And Dr. Rice was going to speak one morning. And I, I was asked to moderate the, the, the service that morning, all the music and so forth. Anyway, a number of pastors did that. And I remember Dr. Rice, I was making the announcements. And, I, and Dr. Rice said, Brother Richards, he's in a wheelchair. He said, Brother Richards, can I say a word? And I thought, say a word? It's your meeting. You can, you can have all of it. And he rolled himself up to the, to the pulpit. And this is what he said. He said, 
you folks know that, that uh, there's been a difference between the soul of the Lord and Bob Jones University. He and Dr. Bob II had, had kind of gotten out and, and Dr. Rice had wrote some articles and Bob Jones University had said some things and, and it had really hurt and hurt Christianity. And he said, I just want to, I just want to apologize to the Lord. He said, he, listen to what he said. Dr. John R. Rice said this. He said, I don't want to go to heaven and when I get up there, I don't want to have the Lord Jesus say to me, why was you mad at Bob, Bob Sr.? I meet Bob Sr. and have him say to me, why, why were you and my boy down here on earth fussing at one another? What were y'all fussing about? Dr. Bob the first was already gone. Dr. Bob Jr. was president at that time of Bob Jones. And he said, he said, I, I don't want to go to heaven and Jesus say to me, here's, here's Bob Jones that you preached with and you were friends and have Dr. Bob say to me, why were you and my boy fussing down here on earth? And boy, that really, that really took, took hold of me. It took hold of that meeting. It drew preachers closer together. I want to say to you, Jesus is coming. I don't know when. I don't know if he'll come in my lifetime. It don't matter. But I believe he's coming. I'm told to look for him every day. If he doesn't come in my lifetime, that's his business. But I'm looking for Jesus to come. And it, it helps me. It encourages me. It strengthens me. Thank the Lord. Do you know what? The, I'm 82 years old. You know what the greatest thing, you know what the second most greatest thing in my life, the second most greatest thing, was when I met Catherine as a teenage girl. I remember when I met her the first time. I was sitting in a car at her cousin's house. I'd gone to pick him up. I'm sitting in an old car, and she walks across the yard, didn't even look at me. Had on blue jeans. White, these white tennis shoes and socks and the blue jeans would roll up at the bottom and I thought, that's one of the prettiest girls I've ever seen. And uh, she went in the house and a few moments she left when her cousin got ready to go, we, he, he got in the car and I said, Audrey, who was that lady, that young lady that came in your house? He said, oh, I said, that was my cousin. I said, her name's Catherine. And I said, well, I want to meet her. And I canaved around and had to Opportunity to meet her at Dairy Queen. We met at Dairy Queen. <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? I bought her a comb with a curl on top, Brother Ray, and she never got over it. We met at Dairy Queen. And uh, she was only a kid, and I was a kid. We got married, and God called me to be a preacher. He'd already called me. I hadn't acknowledged it. But what a blessing all of these years. What a blessing. But the best is yet to come. Can you imagine how many thousands and millions of people are in heaven right now rejoicing and singing and, and doing things for the Lord? I don't know what he'll have us doing, but we'll be busy. And everything we do, we'll enjoy it. Amen. We'll, enjoy, we'll know our families. Preacher, you mean you, you'll know your mother? You, you'll know your father? You'll know your brothers and sisters in heaven? You mean to tell me you believe it? Listen, I... I'd have a hard time believing that I got more sense on earth than I have, I'll have up there. <laughs> yes, we'll know. We'll know. We'll know as we're known. Amen. And what a time. What a time. Yeah. But let me ask you a question. Now be honest with me. If Jesus, if Jesus came today, or which can happen also if you died today, you, you say, don't talk about death. Tell, but listen, we need to. Death is so real. If you died today or if Jesus came today, would you be prepared to meet him? Do you have a time in your life when you, when you call on Jesus and ask him to be your savior? Do you know him? Well, if you don't, you can. You can know him today. You can know him personally. You say, preacher, I, I don't like this idea of having to go down. Hey, you can do it sitting in your seat. You can be saved right where you're sitting if you just say, Lord, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be lost. I want to be with you in eternity. I want you to forgive me of my sins, and He will. He'll save you and come into your life, and you'll have a wonderful life here and a glorious life yonder. Amen. He's coming. Let's stand, please, with our heads bowed, if you would. Heads are bowed. I want to ask a couple of questions. Now, I don't ask them to embarrass you. I ask them to motivate you if I can. How many folks in this building? You can say, Brother Richards, 
I can say this with all confidence. God's given me faith to say this. I'm saved. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. I know I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus did. Would you lift your hand, please? Would you hold it high? Hold it as high as you can. Put them up and hold them up. Oh, all over this building. What a blessing. What a blessing. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Heads are bowed. Hands down. If there's someone that did not raise your hand, and you'd say, Preacher, I've never received this Jesus that you've talked about. Would you let me pray for you? Would you lift your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not saved. Please pray for me. Would you raise your hand, please? Anybody like that? Would you do that? Is the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart to do that? Would you do it? Anybody? You'd lift your hand and say, pray for me. Pray for me. Now, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak again at this church. I thank you for Brother Oliver and the ministry you've given to him. Thank you for the people of this church, the beautiful music, all that we've enjoyed today. I thank you for the guest. Thank you for that people listen so attentively today. Thank you for that. And I pray that you'll continue to bless this church. And Lord, help us to work and serve until you come. Thank you in Jesus' mighty name. My brother, would you come?